I'm Steve Jones. I'm a geologist with uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, Bureau of Abandoned Mine Reclamation. Uh, I've been following the Centralia Mine Fire for oh, 20 or so years now in different capacities. The fire started just southeast of where we're standing in an abandoned strip pit in the Buck Mountain seam. Uh, it was reported to us in May of 1962, uh, and by that us I mean the government, state government. And it's been burning since then. It just had its 40th anniversary there in 2002. Um, when it started, it covered an area perhaps a few acres in size, uh, and now uh, affects an area something on the order of 400 or so acres in size. And in the background behind me here, you can see some of the steaming ground. Uh, it's uh, at least hot enough to evaporate the snow that fell in the last day or so. The federal government was in here on a number of occasions uh, in the late 60s and up through the middle 70s, uh, trying various approaches to, to stop the progress of the mine fire. Most of that was injection of uh, material into the deep mine to stop the advance of the fire, and none of those efforts were successful. Um, there were some attempts to do some excavation, uh, similarly not successful. By the time uh, the Surface Mine Control and Reclamation Act passed, which is federal legislation, passed in 77, and states began to have programs in place that were adequately funded to deal with issues like this, uh, by that point the fire was already uh, much too large and much too expensive to address. Uh, the study that was done by the Federal Office of Service Mining in the early 80s, uh, a two-volume report, it was the GAI study, identified the cost of total extinguishment then to be about $660 million. And today, uh, you know, 20 years later, certainly to, to totally excavate and extinguish this fire, we're not talking uh, at less money. It's, it's certainly a half to three quarters of a billion dollars. To control the fire was somewhat less expensive, and by that I mean to put in some cutoff trenches to isolate the fire to its current burn area, and even that was estimated back in the early 80s at something on the order of a quarter of a billion dollars to do it. Uh, our state program was receiving about 25 million dollars a year to run an, our entire statewide abandoned mine reclamation program. So. It was an extremely expensive proposition to either isolate the fire or extinguish it. There was originally a very large monitoring network installed uh, by the feds in the early 80s. And over the years, the fires moved beyond that monitoring network. Uh, and many of the monitoring boreholes that were installed are now uh, badly damaged. It's a very hostile environment to install steel casing in and a lot of those casings are collapsed or corroded. Uh, so there's not much of a monitoring network left. Um, and, and a very expensive proposition to install a new monitoring network. So now we pretty much do walkovers on the fire and, and visually ascertain uh, what its limits are. Uh, typically the way fires are dealt with all across the country are you either isolate them, that is, you, you set up barriers around them that keeps them no larger than they are. And to isolate this fire in 1983 dollars is about a quarter of a billion bucks. The other uh, methodology for dealing with fires is total excavation. That's the one I'm most comfortable with. That's the one that I've used for the dozen, dozen and a half, couple dozen fires I've worked on in the last 20 years. Um, to, to totally extinguish and excavate this fire 
in 83, 1983 dollars, we're, we're, you know, we were talking 660 million bucks. Uh, and today, it, it's certainly somewhere right around there. Very expensive proposition. Okay, so it's not basically possible. It's possible, it's possible. but improbable. Today, in 2004, the evidence of the underground fire is still visible near Centralia within its southern border. The smoke propagates along the closed part of the Route 61, following subsidence cracks and holes. The water draining from the Centralia Valley is untreated and highly acidic. These are the consequences of the man-made environmental disaster and its imprints in the earth. The human tragedy is yet to follow. Congress really made the decision uh, in, in the early 80s to put up enough money to move people out of harm's way. And at that point, uh, pretty much either isolating the fire or totally extinguishing the fire went on the back burner as an option and uh, the 42 million in relocation money has been used to, to move people out of harm's way. Um, the relocation program sponsored by the government involved destruction of the property. It also put an end to the hopes of prosperity and future in this mining town. That money was basically earmarked to relocate everybody. And I guess there were only ever a thousand people here. And when you're going to spend $42 million, $42 million to relocate a little over a thousand people, you can relocate them with caviar, champagne, limousines. You can, I mean, you know, you, could, you can really do it all fancy. You could have a big old party for every one of them that goes. And they were spending money like drunk sailors around here for a while. And a lot of folks did relocate. Most people ask, why did folks relocate? Most people assume they were terrified of the mine fire. In truth, my own opinion, they got really great deals on their houses. I can't blame them for relocating. I mean, if somebody's going to give you a... If you bought your house for, let's say, I'll be generous, $5,000. And back then, you could have probably bought a row house for that much. And the state offered you forty for it. $40,000, you think, wee, <laughs> boom, out the door. And so it was a great deal. The split between residents was caused by the fact that fire did not propagate through Centralia Valley, and many residents were not affected by smoke. They still believe that the groundwater table under the valley is a natural barrier that will not allow fire to propagate. Only property that was located near the coal exposures on higher elevations would get damaged. My name is Paul Hummel. Uh, I'm the Chief of Anthracite and Industrial Minerals Mine Safety for DEP here in Pennsylvania. I had suggested that one of my engineers develop a report back in 1985 as to how far this fire could extend with, uh, with knowledge on the water elevations and so forth and so on. Well, the fire itself uh, will not be burning below water elevation. And uh, we have areas in, in, uh, that are in the report itself of 1,017 feet of uh, water elevation at that particular area that the, the, the mine fire will not progress through that uh, flooded area. Uh, there are opportunities for the mine fire to travel both eastward, in an easterly direction and a westerly direction, but uh, the, as far as going north and south, that would have lim limitations. One being to the south, the area it has been uh, previously mined and there are no uh, avenues for the fire to progress to 
or propagate to. Uh, going to the north, uh, they would have to go underneath the water table and, uh, and that's not going to happen. So that should have answered that question. <laughs>